welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. We're so happy to have you with us. We've got a tremendous program for you. You're going to enjoy every minute of it. Just think, you're on an airplane, you're ready to take off, and you get this announcement from the pilot. He says, oh, we're sorry, folks, there's no fuel. No fuel in the plane? <laughs> that actually happened on a recent flight due to a massive surge in air travel that's expected to skyrocket this holiday weekend. Travelers can also expect crushing traffic on the roads and, of course, spiking gas prices. What does this all add up to? Maybe some unintended fireworks for the 4th of July. George Thomas has more. 14 months after a global virus brought travel to a screeching halt, the industry is about to hit a frenzied pace. With 46% of Americans fully vaccinated and mask mandates lifted in most places, this holiday weekend is expected to be the busiest since the beginning of the pandemic. There's an amazing amount of pent-up demand for people to connect with each other and reunite. Leisure demand is up more than 100% of what it was in 2019. And that has airlines, for example, struggling to keep up, forced to cancel scores of flights due to staffing shortages. The recovery of air travel has happened so fast, the airlines are scrambling to get as many flights uh, in the air without the labor force often to, uh, to back that up. The massive travel surge also affecting fuel supply, as some 3.5 million are expected to take to the skies in coming days. The pilot comes on the line and says, there this is the first time in 30 years I've to been told there's no fuel. Meanwhile, back on the ground, folks can expect to pay more to fill up at the pump for the foreseeable future. Gas prices right now at the highest they've been since the 4th of July in 2014. It just proves that the road trip is back, stronger than ever, and we expect that trend to continue through the end of the summer. Though in some places, stations are reportedly running out of gas due to a shortage of truck drivers needed to deliver that fuel. The good news is there's plenty of fuel flowing. It's just a matter of time before stations that have lost supply of gasoline have another delivery made. Here at the ocean front in Virginia Beach, Virginia, city officials are telling locals and tourists alike to prepare for traffic congestion as they're expecting larger than normal crowds. Tourists like Chris Smith visiting all the way from Seattle simply thrilled to be out enjoying the water. Well, I think people have, uh, are excited to get out and about and uh, hopefully they'll make wise decisions yeah. on still keeping safe. I thought that I was going to be stuck in the house for a few more years and in like my neighborhood. I didn't think that in like in only a year and a half we were going to be all the way here at Virginia Beach for the second time. According to AAA, from today through Monday, some 50 million people are expected to take a trip of 50 miles or more away from home. George Thomas, CBN News. Well, we hope everybody has a happy and safe fourth that's coming up. But anyhow, it's really bad. You know, we've had that song, Baby, It's Cold Outside. Well, man, it is powerful hot now. In other news, dozens of people are actually dead from the broiling heat. And now massive wildfires are consuming the West. And guess what's brewing up in the Atlantic? Ephraim Graham has more. Emergency officials in Oregon report more than 60 heat-related deaths as the state endured record high temperatures this week. Over one three-day stretch, the state hitting three consecutive highs, topping out at 116. This comes as dozens of wildfires are burning hundreds of thousands of acres across 12 states. More than 9,000 firefighters are deployed on the front lines. Meanwhile, on the East Coast, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and Boston, all declaring heat emergencies Wednesday. And down in the Atlantic Ocean, Tropical Storm Elsa has formed and is moving towards the Caribbean. It could hit Florida early next week. Turning now overseas, China's president is rattling his saber on the 100th anniversary of the nation's Communist Party. President Xi Jinping saying China's ascension to global dominance is an historic inevitability, and his nation will not be intimidated by foreign powers. Anyone who tries to stand in China's way, he said, quote, will find their head bashed. This as reports that China appears to be building 100 new intercontinental ballistic missile silos in western China, pointing to what might be an increase in Beijing's nuclear capabilities. The Communist Party is also targeting religious materials, including Bibles in China, 
recently calling on parents, teachers, and students to turn in all religious books, antagonistic books, and overseas books. That includes videos as well. Pat? I cannot understand. You know, there was a time only a short while ago that China was on the road to becoming the largest Christian nation on the face of the earth. There were about 200 million Christian believers in China, and there was a huge move of God. And they, even that three-self church movement was very powerful. And now Xi has come in. I cannot believe it. It's almost like he is motivated by Satan himself. He is an evil human being. And, you know, the, the idea, you know, the Bible talks about the way being prepared for the kings of the East. And do you suppose this has some prophetic significance? It may well. But one thing for certain, this man is evil, and he wants world domination. It used to be China called itself the Middle Kingdom, and they were happy to be the Middle Kingdom with everybody else doing what they wanted to do. Now he wants to be the World Kingdom. He wants to have hegemony over the entire world, and we can't let it happen. I asked Secretary of State Pompeo when he was with me some time ago, I said, you know, do they have the power to pretend, pre prevent the United States from projecting uh, power into the Far East? And he said, no, they don't. In other words, the U.S. is still the strongest power. But China is doing everything it can, not only to be the middle kingdom, to be the kingdom for the whole world. And I don't think we want to let that happen. Ephraim? Pat, we have more from the Secretary of State in this report. The theory the coronavirus escaped from a lab in Wuhan, China, is gaining more traction. And many people are asking, why didn't the U.S. investigate the theory sooner? Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo points to resistance from inside the State Department and the National Institutes of Health. CBN's David Brody spoke with Pompeo and has the story. When the coronavirus first took off, then Secretary of State Mike Pompeo immediately suspected that the virus may have come from a Wuhan lab instead of a wet market. The medical community, Democrats, and the media wrote him off as a kook. They didn't accept what we said, the data set that we laid out before them, because they played politics. They had a, they had a theory of the case that was based on this was Mike Pompeo saying this. And he works in the Trump administration, and therefore, there's some other angle here. They're trying to, you know, it's a shiny object theory or whatever it is. Now that it appears his suspicions have merit and that controversial gain of function research supported by the U.S. may have also played a part, Pompeo tells us how bureaucrats kept putting up roadblocks as he tried to get to the truth. Inside the State Department, there was lots of debate about the efforts we had underway, but I was just, uh, uh, vicious about demanding that the team do everything they can to sort fact from fiction. If it leads to a conclusion that's not the one that we, we think it is, great. We just want to get to the conclusion. Yeah. And so, but there was enormous resistance. We, we ran over the resistance as best we could, both from inside the State Department and from uh, at NIH and other places, people who didn't want to talk about the fact that there had been grants to the uh, WIV. While that was then, the former secretary hasn't stopped trying to right wrongs. That includes tackling issues like the assault on religious freedom here at home. We saw it during the virus, churches that couldn't gather, pastors that couldn't bring their flock to a place while you had all kinds of other craziness going on, protests in the streets that were acceptable. That is a, a real black mark on religious freedom in America. It's deeply inconsistent with our constitutional right mm -hmm. uh, to, for the free exercise of religion, but more importantly, it strikes at the very moral foundation of our country. Pompeo says a spiritual battle is striking the moral foundation as well. There's a lot of folks that believe we are in a state right now in America of spiritual warfare, if you will. There's no doubt there are folks here in the United States that are uh, trying to place evil in front of us. Mm -hmm. This isn't new for those of us who are Christian, those of us who are uh, believers in right. the Bible. Uh, we know that evil always exists. Uh, we also know that we're all sinners, but we, we know this. We, we have to be strong in our faith. That strong faith would likely play a role in a potential future decision whether he might run for president. Look, you, you've, you've met with some donors, uh, you're, you, you've been in some states, so oh, I don't know, New Hampshire and a couple others. You know, hello, you know, I didn't fall off the turnip truck <laughs> yesterday, uh, so I cover this stuff for a living. Uh, how serious are you about potentially running in 2024? So it's a, a fair question. Uh, mm -hmm. I must say, Susan and I pray every day about how sure. to execute the mission we've been given um, by the Lord. We're going to stay in this fight. I've been at this for decades. Mm -hmm. Today, 
2022 is the marker. Whoever the president is in 2024 needs to have a Senate and a House so that they can actually make the changes that America needs. So it's safe to say that you're surveying the terrain and you'll see what happens after 2022. Is that, is that a fair, is that fake news or not fake it, news? It, it, it is fair to say we're going to stay in the fight. We'll see what role, what role the, the Lord brings to us. David Brody, CBN News. Surveying the terrain and we'll see what happens. Pat? I tell you, that man is a brilliant man. He was number one in his class in West Point. He was on the Harvard uh, Law Review, editor of the Harvard Law Review. The guy is just brilliant. And he's so humble and a very dedicated Christian. The, the, the Republicans right now have a, a, an incredible bench. They've got DeSantis down in Florida, a wonderful governor. They've got the governor of South Dakota, tremendous uh, lady. Uh, they've got uh, Nikki Haley, brilliant person. They've got uh, Senator Scott in South Carolina. They've got people all over the place who are so strong. And as I say, prognosticating, I think there's going to be a tidal wave. I've said it before, I'll say it again. There's going to be a tidal wave that's going to run against critical race theory. It's going to run against crime and, 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 and law and order. Uh, I mean, uh, against the, the breakdown of law and order. They're going to run against inflation. And they're going to run against this nonsense that's going on at the border. And I tell you, it's going to be almost impossible for the Democrats to stand against that. And, and they're just doing everything they can to put stuff in place now because they know they're going to lose the House and they, they may well they lose the Senate. Uh, there's going to be, I understand Herschel Walker now is talking about coming in a, uh, for the Senate seat down in Georgia. I mean, he's a very popular guy. See what happens. But anyhow, they have so many good candidates. And, and the Democrats are just, they're bankrupt. They, they have, what's going on now is just a disgrace. Well, uh, a long time ago, uh, there was a president named George Bush. And his secretary of, of defense uh, was a very powerful guy. And uh, he had run a company called G.D. Searle uh, that um, was involved in some medical things that I didn't think were too, too good for the country. But nevertheless, that was Donald Rumsfeld. And uh, Ephraim's got a story about we're saddened that this man who was so powerful and served our country so well has passed on. Ephraim. That former Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld has died at the age of 88. He led the Pentagon under Presidents Gerald Ford and George W. Bush and is known for overseeing the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Rumsfeld said the invasion of Iraq and subsequent removal of Saddam Hussein created a more stable and secure world. A family spokesman said the cause of death was multiple myeloma. As the U.S. prepares to pull out of Afghanistan, the military solution is, situation rather is deteriorating rapidly. Twenty years after American forces drove the Taliban from power, there are fears the terrorist group is poised to retake the country. Dale Hurd is on this story. This is Taliban video of victory celebrations after more districts in Afghanistan were taken over by the group in just the past few days. Here are elite U.S. trained Afghan government forces surrendering and shaking hands with Taliban commanders. And here are U.S. Humvees now at the service of rebel forces. The U.S. military's top commander in Afghanistan, General Austin Miller, says he's worried about the rapid loss of districts to the Taliban. The loss of terrain and the, and the rapidity of that loss of terrain has, has to be concerning. We're starting to create conditions here that won't look good for Afghanistan in the future if there's a push for a military takeover. This map shows that most of Afghanistan, the areas shaded red and black, are already under Taliban control or are being contested. As the Taliban advance across Afghanistan, the announced withdrawal of U.S. forces has only emboldened them. The White House has set September 11th as the deadline for a full troop withdrawal, which began under Donald Trump. But retired four-star General Jack Keane says the Biden administration's assurances of support to the Afghan government remind him of similar assurances given by President Obama when the U.S. withdrew from Iraq. And what followed was a nightmare for the region. 
These are the similar statements that were made by the Obama administration in 2011 as our troops were withdrawing, and we know what happened as a result of that. We got ISIS. The war in Afghanistan began 20 years ago, after 9-11. The cost of the war is a staggering two and a quarter trillion dollars. One expert called it the largest failed global redistribution project in history. Almost 2,500 American military servicemen and women have died. But you'll hear no gratitude from former Afghan President Hamid Karzai, who says the U.S. has failed and should just go. They're living behind a country in conflict with so much loss of life, with so much suffering. Panic in Kabul is building as the Taliban march toward the capital. Those who can choose to go abroad have left. It will long be debated whether America should have ever gotten itself involved on the ground in Afghanistan. But America's departure is certain to bring more suffering and death to this troubled nation. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Departure has many concerns. Pat. Breaks your heart, doesn't it? Alexander the Great couldn't make it in Afghanistan, and subsequent people haven't been able to either. Uh, it, it is a country that's divided between warlords and various tribal leaders. Karzai was a pain in the neck. He should never have been in, and he, he, he stabbed us in the back right along, despite taking all of our money. The amount of money and, and treasure that was spent and lives lost is just shocking. But... Uh, that will now become a base. The Taliban hates women, wants to impose extreme Sharia on the country, doesn't believe in educating girls. I mean, you go down the list of the awful things they're doing, and you read some of this nonsense in the papers, say, well, we ought to make a deal with them. You don't deal with the people as evil as they are. But it, we've got no choice. We've been there too long. We spent too much money. But what do we do next? Well. Uh, remember what happened when we didn't have a status of forces agreement and just pulled out willy-nilly out of Iraq and out came ISIS. What will happen uh, in, in Afghanistan is too early to tell. And whether it will become a base of terror, it obviously will. Will it link up with Pakistan and others against the United States? Probably. But what can we do about it? Probably nothing. And it's, it's time to go home and everybody said so. And I guess that's the truth. I mean, we, we can't stay, but the warlords will continue to fight one another, and uh, and they will obviously turn on the United States. So, <laughs> tough luck. Well, just imagine your doctor gives you the all clear. Hey, you're cancer free, so you can resume your normal life, or maybe you can't. Many cancer survivors suffer emotional and spiritual fallout that could linger for years. So what can you do about it? Medical reporter Laurie Johnson. If you're a cancer survivor, you likely know the fear that the disease might be back whenever you experience the slightest ache or pain. Anxiety and depression are common emotions among patients given a clean bill of health, yet they're rarely discussed. Some call it cancer PTSD. That feeling often lingers because of the impact from the original devastation they felt upon hearing the words, you have cancer. For most of us, we don't have any signs or symptoms of cancer. And that diagnosis comes out of the blue and sends us into instant um, shock and fear and panic and, and disbelief. A successful marketing executive, Cynthia Hayes, thought she was healthy. Then a routine pap test revealed an aggressive gynecological cancer. I needed a, um, a radical hysterectomy and then uh, six months of, of chemotherapy. It was a very uh, disorienting experience. The treatment worked, and doctors told her the cancer was gone. For Cynthia, however, the emotions associated with her disease remained. We go back to um, being fearful because, again, our bodies betrayed us. We can't trust that we're going to know if the cancer is back. She found out she wasn't alone. After doing her own research involving cancer doctors, mental health experts, and hundreds of survivors. I was surprised at the degree to which cancer was an emotional diagnosis as well as a physical one. 
That revelation led to her best-selling book, The Big Ordeal, Understanding and Managing the Psychological Turmoil of Cancer. They're all struggling with, uh, with loss and with a, a sense of identity that we need to recapture um, as we are coming out of the, uh, out of the experience. To do that, your body needs help. Her advice, start with an anti-inflammatory diet. Eating vegetables, fruits, healthy fats, and clean protein while staying away from sugar and processed foods. Exercise also improves emotional well-being, as does easing back into stressful responsibilities. It's so easy to think that, well, okay, now I've got to make up for I was out of the office for six months or I wasn't pulling my weight at home for you know a period of time. I've got to make, make up for it. Talking through your emotions can also help. Most hospitals and cancer centers have um, psychosocial uh, support or supportive care or palliative care. And all of those resources um, are there for you if you ask for them. You can also find a variety of online support groups and a growing number of churches provide cancer ministries. This helps participants grow emotionally and spiritually. You know, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to go back to the church. I'm going to uh, do whatever it is that I haven't done because I've been so focused on other things. But now I see that um, uh, now that now that cancer has taught me so much about what's important to me. While no one wants a cancer diagnosis, I've heard from some who received successful treatment and processed the associated emotions in a healthy way. They've told me how facing death put life in proper perspective and became the best thing that ever happened to them. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Well, the big C is not cancer, it's Christ. And we need to look to him rather than cancer. I might say, you're looking at somebody 30-some years ago, uh, I had a diagnosis, I had all those numbers, you know, I had a Gleason of seven and a PST of whatever it is of four, and it was, uh, it. anyhow, they said, you've got cancer, prostate cancer. I said, well, it's one, well, they said, you can go to MD Anderson, or you can, get, you can get injections, you can get this, that, and the other. I said, cut the thing out. <laughs> I mean, let's not talk about it, let's cut it out. So they said, okay, they wound up cutting it out. And so it's gone, and 30 years later, I'm here praising the Lord. So, uh, but anyhow, this thing is called the big ordeal. Cynthia Hayes, uh, understanding the psychological turmoil. People just get freaked out when they say it's cancer. But um, uh, I think there are a lot of ways you can do it. And Laurie talked about some of the, it's the same sort of diet thing that you have with everything else. Apparently, most of the problems we have in our bodies is caused by inflammation. And inflammation, the cancer cells will feed on that. You can also starve the cancer cells. And so, anyhow. Let's stay healthy and let's praise the Lord and let's have a wonderful 4th of July. And you can get the book about Cynthia Hayes if you want to. And let's be Big C Christ, okay, not cancer. How about this for a question? Are you Osama bin Laden's cousin? <laughs> well, that's the kind of heckling a young boy endured when he and his family emigrated to America from Egypt. The heckling soon became physical bullying. So how did this brutal harassment crush the boy's spirit? Or did fireworks on the 4th of July finally set him free? You're about to find out. I was the first one to get it from the mailman. I ran up our entire apartment building screaming and hollering, and everybody knew. 12-year-old Fetty Gobriel's dreams were about to come true. His dad, a chef in Cairo, Egypt, got a job in Boston. The family was moving to America. We idolized almost or daydreamed about this idea of coming to America, the land of freedom, of opportunity, better education, better future. However, those hopes and dreams didn't come out the way Fetty pictured. He and his family arrived a year after 9-11. Kids would say stuff like, hey, are you um, Osama bin Laden's cousin or uh, Saddam Hussein's cousin? So. I was buried under all of the verbal harassment as well as the physical bullying as well. The rejection, feeling like an outsider. Fetty says the legalistic Christian faith he grew up in often made him feel the same way. There was the, the shame piece that was reinforced at home and at church. I need to be good enough 
for God to love me and accept me and that depended purely on my works and my and my good performance, uh, which I can never do enough of. The part of it that wore me out the most was feeling powerless against my own sin. I sin Monday through Saturday, I go to the priest on Sunday, I confess my sin and rinse, wash, repeat uh, this same cycle. So I'm in a permanent state of inability to please God. Why am I even here? By his teen years, Fetty had drawn one conclusion. God is ticked at me. God is angry at me. God doesn't like me. I'm not enjoying anything. Everything is, is difficult. Everything is challenging. Uh, I want to escape that and go to a place where I'm not being bullied, where I am having fun, where I am enjoying myself. In high school, Fetty found friendship in a group of classmates. While it marked the end of the bullying, it also led him to smoking pot, drinking, and sleeping around. He also started buying into the beliefs of some in the group who were atheists and telling himself he could live a life free of guilt and shame. I would have said, like, I don't believe that God exists. And maybe underneath that, in a more honest moment, I would have said, I don't want to believe that God exists. I like what I'm doing, and I don't want God to tell me to do otherwise. Instead of finding freedom and happiness. It was just this downward spiral. I'm awake, I'm aware. I feel futility and purposelessness. Let me go back to the drugs in order to numb that feeling, this underlying uh, a restlessness, right? Where I just don't have peace. The teenager fought with his parents often. To keep the peace, Fetty would go to church on occasion. He was still living at home his freshman year of college when a family they knew invited them to visit their church. Fetty says it was much different from what he was used to. People there were genuine, sincere, they were loving, really free, full of joy, full of peace, who loved Jesus. Also different was the teaching about a loving God ready to forgive all sins through Jesus Christ, a message that would lead Fetty's parents and brother to fully commit their lives to Jesus. The fights and the tone and the anger at home was completely changed. Uh, my mom had a lot more peace. As for Fetty, he continued drinking, smoking pot, and partying, unable to accept God's message of redemption that had changed those around him. The resistance was, I can't believe that God would ever forgive me for all of the terrible, wicked, horrible things that I've done. I I'm not at peace anywhere, at home, at church, with God. I'm not at peace with myself. The summer after Fetty's freshman year, his dad insisted he go with the family to a church conference on the 4th of July weekend. Reluctantly, Fetty went. But as he listened to the speakers, God's message of love and forgiveness finally broke through. I'm hearing about the cross and the fact that Jesus died for my sin in order to forgive me and to cleanse me and, and to give me a new life and to reconcile me with God. And I felt like God just cornered me with his love and just embraced me in his arms and said, hey, son, I love you. I've forgiven you of all your sin and I'm giving you my spirit. And that was that was my moment. That was my moment of, of surrendering my life to Christ. Fetty made a clean break from his lifestyle, losing all desire for drugs and alcohol as he discovered his new identity in Christ. The way that I think about myself anymore is not this horrible, terrible, wicked, no good sinner that God hates and despises. That was me, but because of the gospel and because of my position now being in Christ, God looks at me and he's very well pleased. God looks at me and he sees, Jesus and that conception of who I am before the sight of God changes everything. After college, Fetty married Renee and became a pastor at the Arabic Baptist Church in Boston. Every 4th of July, he celebrates his own personal Independence Day. Independence from sin and death and hell in the grave uh, because we've been united to Christ. So the symbolism there is not lost on me. God met me and, and completely transformed me and renewed me by his grace, uh, which, you know, I wasn't there looking for God. 
but hey, you got, God was there looking for me. I want to say something. There's nothing that you and I can do that will make us more worthy in God's eye than we already are because we are his child, his children. You are a son or daughter. He created us in his image. And our works aren't going to make us any more worthy than we are or aren't. Now, the thing that has separated us from God is our sin. But at the same time, God doesn't look at us as worthy, unworthy, dirty, filthy sinners. The Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. So the stuff that we've done doesn't make any difference. The things that we are are not going to make us any more worthy before God. God loves you because of who you are, because you are made in His image, and He loves you. Now, if you're a sinner, He doesn't hate you because you're a sinner, but your sin will block out His presence in your life. And so Jesus Christ died to pay the price for the sin you've committed. It's already done. He won't take it back. It's already done. And what he says, if you will receive me, I will bring you into my Father's house. But you're not going to be made any more worthy because you have lived a nice, righteous life. He loves you as you are. He loves you where you are. He knows who you are. He knows your name. He knows what you've done. And he loves you. And he died for you. And when you come to the Lord, he doesn't see a sinner. He sees Jesus. He looks at you and sees his son because he wants his son to be formed in you. And that's what God is going to do. He's going to come into you and he's going to make you like Jesus. And you will be righteous, you will be holy, and you will be fully acceptable in his sight. Now, what, is he, what have you got to do? You have to do some good works. You have to climb up the Santa Scala on your knees. You have to prostrate yourself. You have to go on a pilgrimage. You have to flagellate yourself, beat yourself with whips. No, none of those things. What you have to do is believe by faith. You are born again by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, what do you want to do? How do you have to move from one place to another? Well, first of all, repentance, the word is metronoia. It means you've got another thought. And so you're going in this direction, all right? And then suddenly you have an afterthought, metanoia, and you turn around and you go in this direction. That's what it's all about. It's like the man woke up at the pigsty and he said, look, I, I, I'm in the pigsty and my father's house has got a pretty good deal, so I want to go and change. So if you are willing to change right now, the Lord will be there with you and he will make you in the image of Jesus Christ. And you will have joy. You will have peace. You will have forgiveness. And the things in your life uh, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So what I want you to do right now, I want you to pray with me. Pray these words. Do it now. Jesus, I'm going the wrong way. And Lord, I want to change. I know you love me, but I've tried to be worthy in your sight. And I know it's not on account of works that I have done, but it's through your grace. So I know you died for me, and I'm turning away, Lord, right now. And I ask you to come into my heart. Lord Jesus, hear me now. Come into my heart. Live your life in me, and I will live for you, and I will serve you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord. Now, Father, for those who prayed with me just then, may the power and the, of the Holy Spirit come upon them, fill them, and change them into the image of your Son from this moment on. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, if you prayed with me, I've got something I want to give you. We, we're not talking about any money or anything. This is free. I, I went into the audio room some time ago, and I made a 73-minute disc but what it is to be a new creature in Christ. 
What about it is to be born again? What if you sin? All these things that you ask questions about. And along with it, there's a little booklet that has the scriptures. And we'll give this to you free. So I'm asking you to pick up the telephone and call in right now and say, look, I just prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord. And I just know something wonderful has happened. I feel like I'm a new creature. I've been born again. 1-800-700-7000. Please pick up the phone and call. And if you need further prayer, we're here for you. If you want prayer for miracles or whatever, 1-800-700-7000. Go to your phone right now and say, look, I just prayed with Pat, and I have given my heart to Jesus. I'm a new creature because God loves me. 1-800-700-7000. And we'll send you this little book. If you don't want to give your name, that's cool too. But you need to confess what you've done. So just pick up the phone. Toll free. No money. Just call. Okay? And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. New York prosecutors are expected to announce a criminal indictment of the Trump Organization and its chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg reportedly on tax crimes connected to perks and benefits awarded to employees. This comes after a two-year investigation. Weisselberg surrendered to the Manhattan DA's office this morning with an arraignment set for this afternoon. While much of the United States is experiencing an historic heat wave, it's an entirely different situation in Brazil. Unusually cold weather has brought snow to the South American country, better known for its sunshine and beach life. People in the southern state of Santa Catarina have had three days of snow, blanketing a number of cities to the delight of people who live there. The cold weather will continue through the week. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Heartbroken and horrified. That's how Sherry Rose Shepard felt when she was blindsided and devastated almost overnight. So how did Sherry learn to survive and to put purpose to her pain? Take a look. Former Mrs. America Sherry Rose Shepard is a sought after speaker and best-selling author who has been in full-time ministry for the past 30 years. Despite her faithfulness to God, she lost everything she loved five years ago all at once. Her 25 year marriage ended and she received a terminal cancer diagnosis with only eight weeks to live. In her book, Beyond the White Picket Fence, Cherry Rose shares her journey of heartbreak, healing, and rebuilding after losing everything. Please welcome back to the 700 Club, Sherry Rose Shepherd. It's good to have you with us. Oh, it's an honor. I was 35 last time I was with you. Now I'm 60. <laughs> it goes fast, doesn't it? <laughs> T Sherry, talk a little bit about your life five years ago. Everything turned upside down. What was going on? Well, I was on tour in arenas with wonderful artists like Mercy Me and Casting Crowns and Michael W. Smith. And my book hit the bestseller list. And I was eating all organic and healthy. And it seemed like overnight everything fell apart at once. I felt uh, like a Job all the way down to the tumors on my lymphatic system, like boils. It was overwhelming. And to be totally honest, in that moment, once I, uh, first of all, I went numb. <laughs> I think there's like a system that you go through. First of all, I just went numb, like this is not happening. It's a bad dream, I'm gonna wake up from it. But as the year went through and I noticed that God uses even the most deepest, pain to do even deeper surgery. But I had never dreamed in a million years my life would have fallen apart that much. I felt like I paid it forward. I was, I'm a Jewish believer. I already lost my Jewish family for being a Christian. As you know, today my Jewish family is all born again. I have came from a dysfunctional family when no one else came from divorced family when I was young. And I felt like I paid everything forward, got saved and lived happily ever after. And I found out that the white picket fence that we think is represents the dream of America actually represents people giving up their ammunition, giving up their um, fences, their iron fences, putting up a white fence saying, I will fight for freedom and support the military. And I now understand what it means for us to be in the Lord's army and fighting the good fight. And I had to hang on to 
no matter how many days God gives me, I need to fight the good fight, keep my faith and finish my race, even if it's just laying on my back, dictating in a book, even if it's the one strong day I have to do a Facebook Live to encourage someone. Well, let's talk but about, I, you talked, to, you, you mentioned in that, you know, no matter how many days you had on top of your marriage falling apart at that point, you were given only eight weeks to live. That was five years ago. So how have you survived? <laughs> well, there's a lot of survival skills, but the first thing I started to work on is my broken heart. Because I saw the scripture, a man's body can withstand sickness, but who can withstand a crushed spirit? So I got the help I needed to fix the broken heart and really began to work on that. And I found my way back to God before I was married, before I had cancer. I wanted to, I asked God, how do I find my way back to you? I feel like you're not with me. And he said, go back to the beginning when you first met me. So I started to play worship music from years ago in the 80s when I first gave my life to the Lord. I started to um, listen to messages I listened to years ago. And, and really put myself back to just me and God. Because when this life is over and it's all said and done, that's what it's going to be, us and God. And then secondly, I just realized that I needed to really mourn. I needed to learn to sow with tears so I could find joy again. That was something I wasn't good at. I used to use scriptures as band-aids. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But there's a process and getting through pain. And that's one of the things that Beyond the White Pick Offense is about. It's not just my story. It's eight different stories of many people's tragedies and the process of what God can do and what we can do to get through those different tragedies. I don't think and most people, when they're in pain, recognize that there could be any purpose in it. But the truth is, you found purpose in your pain. What are some of the lessons you learned that have sustained you? Well, one of the things that I learned is every season of suffering has an expiration date. It were promised there's a season for everything. So I hung on to that hope. Secondly, I hung on to eternity. And thirdly, I hung on to my legacy. I thought if I deny God now, if I give up on God now, I literally feel like I would have thrown away 30 years of ministry. And my determination to keep my faith has rippled into my children, my grandchildren. I have a brand new ministry called His Royal Family, where I minister to people's children, to the elderly, to divorced. God has taken all of that pain and used it in His Royal Family Ministries to remind us we're not here for very long. And, you know, I always laugh with people when they go, oh, my word, you have cancer, you're going to die. I said, well, you're going to die too. Yes. News flashed. We all have a life to live and we have to make that decision. What are we living for? Because sometimes when everything's removed, we realize that we were living for everything but the Lord. Like it's easy to praise God when all the blessings are coming in, right? Mm -hmm. But you get to know who God is when all the tangible things are taken away and the spirit of God comes in and truly is close to the brokenhearted truly does bind up the wounds of the brokenhearted. And now God has given me such a new ministry. And there's so many people now going through devastation. Oh, so and they many. just need... And I, we're, we're out of time, but I just want to mention to people, we have just skimmed the surface because Sherry's book is called Beyond the White Picket Fence. It's available where books are sold, just filled with great wisdom, especially if you're going through a difficult time. Uh, get back to the fact that you, the joy of the Lord is available to you. Sherry, thank you so much. It's great to have you back with us today. Bless you guys. You too. Well, as we start our email questions from all of you, the first one's fascinating, Pat, from Mary, who says, I just want to ask you a very simple question. If you were president today, what's the very first thing that you would do? The first thing I would do, I'd get on my knees and say, God, I can't do this. It's too big a job for me. And if you don't help me, I'm finished. So please give me your strength. And I would ask for wisdom. I'd ask for the anointing and the things that I always ask for. The first thing I do, say, God, you know all these things, and it's so complicated. Will you please lead me? Mm -hmm. And that's what every president, they ought to get on their knees and start. 
<laughs> and ask God to do it, okay? Okay, this is Ursula who says, if God so loved the world, then why did he allow his son to be tortured? If God can do that to his own son, then what's in store for us? I just can't get past the fact that he allowed his son to be humiliated, tortured, and hung on a cross for the world to see. Why did God need to do that for us? I don't understand. Well, Ursula, the first thing I want to tell you is, as nice as you are, you aren't the one that was destined to change the, the whole universe. And sin had come into the world, and hatred and bitterness, and the devil was revolting against God in the heavenlies. It was a fight in the heavenlies against Satan. And the world had sinned, and Satan was bringing accusation against the entire world and saying, look, you ought to destroy them because they have sinned against you. And God says, all right, instead of punishing them, I'm going to take their punishment on myself. And that's why the Son of God, he said, it pleased the Lord to, to it pleased God to bruise him. But he bore the sins for all of us. The Apostle Paul said, I fill up in my body what is lacking of the sufferings of Christ. But uh, I, I don't think that... Uh, any of us can understand what it's all about. That has nothing to do uh, with, with you suffering. It is the fact that, that God did it not because he's cruel and not because he, he hated his son. He did it so that the penalty of all the sins of mankind would be laid on Jesus. All right. This is Marie who says, my daughter and son-in-law are attending a Calvinist church. She now believes God chose whoever will receive Jesus and be allowed into heaven. She bases this in part on Romans 9. Can you explain Paul's words in Romans 9? Is there any other interpretation than that God loves whom he chooses to love and hates whom he chooses to hate? I've always believed we were all born with a free will. We are, but uh, you know, it, it says, uh, you know, uh, God uh, loved uh, uh, Jacob and he hated Esau, but he, he, the hatred wasn't that he loved him, he liked him better. I mean, he preferred the one, that's what, it, and so God does prefer certain ones. And uh, he said, you know, we're talking about the clay that's being uh, formed in the potter and certain ones are, are formed in one way and the other. Um, yes, we all have free will. And we all have an opportunity to come to the Lord. And the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so I, I, I know it's a little confusing, but I don't believe in the idea that predestined, that people are predestined to go to hell. I just don't believe in that bound will. It may be extreme Calvinist, but I don't happen to be an extreme Calvinist, okay? All right. Okay. Well, Brittany wants to know, she was reading the book of Job, noticed it said God was gathered with his sons and then Satan show, showed up. What's the difference between God's sons and his angels? Well, I think in this case, it's the same thing. I mean, he was, the heavenly host was with him and uh, uh, the sons of God. Uh, I think uh, we're talking about the angels, sorry. Okay, that's all the time we've all got right. for today. Well, thank you very much. Questions. Thank you. Well, today's Power Minute is from Psalm 36. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Well, tomorrow, China's revolutionary new form of digital currency. Why is it a dangerous threat to the U.S. and to the rest of the free world? That'll be on tomorrow's 700 Club. So for Terry and all of us, thank you again for sharing this time with us. It's our privilege to be able to serve you. And remember, if you have any kind of a need while the program is off the air, the telephones are still available. People are on the phone 24 hours a day to take your calls. So for all of us, this is Pat Robertson. May the Lord bless you and keep you. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.